Let's stand and worship together. Welcome to Community Life Church. I'm so excited to be worshiping with you this morning. It's just an amazing pleasure to be able to be in here with you. Um, as we move into our next song, this is an opportunity. If you've came prepared to give, we have an opportunity for you to give during this next song. So you have a multitude of options. If you want, you can come up during the song and place your offering in the basket. Or, like Gordo, you can text to give. Or, if you're online, if you look at the comment section, we have a link there for you to give online if you would like. So, let's keep worshiping through our giving. This song is called Sons and Daughters. I don't know if you guys have sang it here before, but God calls us his children. We can call him father. We're not just servants or followers. That's what the song is about. Let's sing about it. Before he spoke creation, the God of heaven knew our names. Formed in his reflection, we are his glory on display. And his heart is good. He's always kind with the cross he proved he's on my side we are the sons we are the daughters of god no matter where we go we're close to the father's heart and though we stand
sons we are the daughters of God Amen His love He lavished on us and called us children of the King And in His loving kindness He chose the Lord His heart is good, He is always kind, with the cross He proved, He is on my side. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God, no matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. We are the Lord's and He will never forsake His own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. Remind me I belong to you And when I can't see past the dark of night Remind me Lord is by my side And when the lies speak louder than the truth Remind Step inside of that role 
as his child. We are serving him this morning, but we are family.
So with all of my life, I will worship you. Yeah. I will worship you. Yeah. We will worship you. Give him praise today. Thank him for being faithful to us until the end. What beautiful songs, huh? You guys listen to the songs you sing? (laughs) Sometimes I wonder if I really like, if I get it. And I listen to these songs and it talks about being sons and daughters of God. And and then I look at sometimes how I live and I'm looking at that going, are you acting like a son or daughter of God? (laughs) And so when we sing these songs, I think it's so vitally important for us to keep in mind that we sing them because we're believing them, right? And so there's no shame in standing there going, you know what, I'm not sure I'm, I'm with that yet. So then just be a part of the moment. Sometimes we sing it because we're longing, we're choosing to get there. And sometimes we're all there. So regardless of where you are at today, as we pray, I just want you to allow God just to speak to your heart right now. Can you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we're here this morning and we're looking toward, we're just looking toward you. Some of us are here because we're just ready to worship you and we're all in, we're focused. Some of us are here because people dragged us here. And regardless of why we're here, I believe it's intentional that we're here. That as we learn from your word today that, wow, what excitement and what empowerment can come from your word. And so we just ask you to guide our minds and our hearts and our spirits today to be open to your truth. Thank you for for what a wonderful team that we have, both on stage and off the stage, that just make things happen. Thank you for those who are faithfully giving and sharing of their time and their talents and their treasures because they love you. And so we just receive that now as a family. And we ask you for your unique anointing to hear and to be able to speak your word. In Jesus' name we all say, amen. You may be seated. As we get started here today, I don't know if you saw these when you came in. These are pretty cool things. Look at this. This is a community live face mask. Oh, yeah. We got on the bandwagon. We totally did that, right? And so you can get those. I don't know if we have any more up here, but uh, the first service, man, they liked those a whole bunch. And um, and so we we got rid of, right, like 40 of them. And it's just by donation, so you give something or don't give something. but, But we wanted to have an opportunity for us to be united together. We were wearing them anyway. Or you can just wear your own. So today begins a brand new series that is entitled My Community Life. And and I know that when we look at that, you're going, oh, they're going to talk about this church. And that's not true. Actually, we're going to talk about the church, right? The whole church of Jesus Christ. Big C church, as I like to say. Rather, I guess it would be for you this way, right? (laughs) But Big C church. And um, and so we're looking. Actually, no, I'm wrong. When I'm looking at you guys, I got to process this because I tell you wrong information, it bothers me. And, and so we're talking about the church of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the family of God. We're not just talking about uh, this local church, but the whole church. And so when I talk about community life, talking about what that looks like to have community life, that type of life, uh, which is in a community uh, within believers. And the book of Ephesians is going to walk us through that little by little. Now, in the book of Ephesians, we have six chapters, and we're going to walk through at least five, as much as we can over the next five weeks, tackle a a lot of the book of Ephesians. Now, I don't believe for a moment that these type of studies necessarily are super entertaining, but I do believe they are completely empowering. And so if you hear the Word of God today, if you take notes, if you just receive what you hear today, I believe it will transform everything that you think you know about who you are. And it can, and it can just set you on a new trajectory in life. But it comes down to a choice. 
comes down to a choice. So here we are, My Community Life, a study of the book of Ephesians. Now, in preparation for each week, I want to encourage you to read the chapter. Read the chapter. So this week, we're talking a little bit about chapter 1. I'm going to give you an overview of the book, and then we're going to talk about chapter 1. And, uh, and then next week, we're going to go into chapter 2. So in order to prepare for next week, we're going to read chapter... You guys are so on it today. And so we're going to do that a little bit today. And it's going to be super great. And to make sure that you read that for next week. Bring your Bibles with you so you can write in it. You have full permission to write in your Bible. You can write it. You can highlight it. You can do whatever you want. There's highlighting... Uh, Bible highlighting highlighters that are specifically designed for little pages like this instead of bleeding through. So there's so many ways you can study God's Word, and I want to help you along with that. Who in here is on Facebook? Raise your hand. <laughs> Silly question, right? And so we do that, but who's, who does Instagram, right? That's kind of a cool thing. And the last people, that's the younger people. No offense, that's just statistics. Okay, so I'm looking on my phone here, and you go on here, and you know how they got... Uh, Somewhere in the... I hope I don't get distracted by doing this. Have you ever sat down and you go to do something and you get distracted by your Facebook? Well, I'm preaching right now, so I shouldn't be distracted. Um, but there's a lot of people on there. Okay. All right. Here we go. People you may know section. You ever done that? You ever seen that people you may know? These are not your friends on Facebook. These are people they think you might know because you have 43 mutual friends. One mutual friend. 72. How am I not friends with her? 72, uh, okay, and then I have another person. I don't know why I'm on there other than I probably searched for this person. And I go through here, and you have people you may know. Have you ever thought that at times that your walk with Jesus, right, or your faith journey, I should say, not your walk with Jesus, your faith journey, has a point where you come on your life page, and under people you may know comes up our Heavenly Father. And you go, oh, I have some mutual friends. And you just keep going. It's easy to do because in a world where believe, people that call themselves believers don't act like believers, it's hard to, to really be drawn towards that in some way. I'm not trying to make the scripture or, or following Jesus attractive. I'm not trying to be a better salesman than Jesus for following Jesus. In fact, he made it very clear that this is hard. This is a thankless job. This is something that, hey, let the dead bury their own. No, you don't need to say goodbye. Like he just said, no, just come leave everything, come follow me. And all too often in our society, we try to commercialize following Jesus and make it more appealing, right? Oh, if you follow Jesus, it'll be good. Everything will be fine. Everything. No, it won't. Following Jesus will get you some enemies, man. Following Jesus, and when Jesus came, and this is a little bit different from first service, so you just got to track with me, because these are some of the thoughts that are coming to my mind. Jesus came, and he says, listen, if you, th you, you, you may think that I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I came that you're actually going to have people divided. And it's not so much that he's actually going to cause one to hate the other. It's that one is going to love Jesus so much and love the Heavenly Father so much that there's just going to be that tension. Because those who trust and love Jesus think differently or should think differently because of the power of the Holy Spirit than those who don't trust and love Jesus. And so there's the conflict. The people don't understand. Why would you go to a Bible college? People don't understand. Why would you give money to that church? People don't understand. Why would you give your time to that church? Why would you volunteer when you get nothing in return? So people don't understand the things of God unless you have the Spirit of God. And so when you're looking on your phone and you're just kind of going through here, I'm just wondering if, if, if you would friend God. I'm just wondering if there was multiple, like mutual friends, if whether or not that would actually be a community life that you'd want to be a part of. And if you say, I'm not really sure, I never really thought about it. I go to church and I do this and I do that. But the idea that we're talking about through the book of Ephesians is much bigger than going to church. It's much, much bigger than reading your Bible. It's much, much bigger than praying when you're sad. It's much bigger than that. It's actually a lifestyle change of following Jesus, the one who died on a cross, for you and for me. It's actually understanding who you are in Christ. And that's a big thing of what we're going to actually learn in the book of Ephesians. The big idea that we're going to focus on is that we can be a part of God's family. 
Initially, it was for the Jews. The Jews understood it, the Jews received it, and then it was for primarily for the Jews in that understanding. But then broadening that throughout the book of Ephesians, you can see where the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, this is not just for the, for the Jews who received it first, but now for all people, for the Gentiles too. We are the Gentiles, by the way. And so this is for all people. Following Jesus is for all people. We can be a part of of the family of God, of God's family. Now, when we have community life in that way, we can stand strong together. Here's the challenge. When you think you're standing strong because you're standing alone, you're deceiving yourself. You think you're strong. You feel like, oh, I got this figured out, that Lone Ranger syndrome. The reality is, is that you're deceived. You're actually far more fragile than you realize. You're actually far more vulnerable than you realize when it comes to you standing strong. Us together as a community is so much stronger. And it actually, I would just simply say it is strong. Because when you stand on yourself, stand by yourself, you're really not even strong. You're actually weak. So together, we can be a family. So we're going to talk a little bit about the book of Ephesians um, I'm, my notes are going to be slightly different than some of the notes that you'll see on the screen, so I'm going to try to follow the screen a little bit better so we can be, so we can be on task with each other. Now, um, anybody going to restaurants right now? Anybody going to restaurants? Okay, before COVID, anybody go to a restaurant? Boom. And so you ever go to a restaurant, you're surrounded by people, and you just get overwhelmed with excitement, and you say, you know what? I'm going to pay for this meal because I got a handy-dandy right? Credit card. And you pull out your little wallet, guys, right? Number one, dad. I know I'm the only one that has this because there's not more than one number one. And so I'm kind of it. And so you might have be a number two dad. But nonetheless, I have the wallet that says number one dad that I received from my kids. And so that's a cool thing. And I pull out my credit card, which in, in the interest of Financial Peace University, we use this um, when we have the cash to back it up. We don't just use it to use it because then you get yourself in trouble. That's not in Ephesians. <laughs> That's just wisdom. Okay, and you pull out your credit card, right? I have my numbers facing me just in case you were wondering. And so you got the credit card and you go, charge it. And then, and then they take it and then they do their little running around thing and they come back. You ever have this moment? And they show you the card like you forgot what it looked like. Sir, ma'am, um, we ran this three times. And I'm sure it's on our end. <laughs> sure it's us. <laughs> Do you have another one? Because this one didn't go through. And then you try to like talk through it and you're kind of like, well, I don't know what's going on there. And if you're married, you blame your spouse if they're not there, right? So-and-so must have had a shopping spree or so-and-so must have bought a new thing and I don't know. Here, try this one. And you pull something out because you're trying to kind of be cool about it because you did not realize what you did not have. You thought you had more than what you actually did. Oh yeah, my credit limit is this, and I'm sure I have a little bit of a buffer there, but then you forgot those shoes or that tool you bought, right? And so you, you don't realize that you actually have less than what you have. What's even more of a tragedy is when you live like you're poor, and yet you have access to plenty. What's an even worse dynamic than thinking you have it and don't is actually having it and not realizing it. And so throughout the book of Ephesians, we learn about our wealth as a believer. We actually learn these things in our life. We, we learn about what, what does it actually mean to be a child of God. Let me give you an outline for the book of Ephesians. Uh, technically, you could take Ephesians. There's six, there's six chapters. You could take this and split it right down the middle. Three chapters over here, right? One to three. I don't know why they're over here. They could be over here, but I'm just over here right now. One to three is basically doctrinal and is typical of a Pauline text. That's just the, the way that the Apostle Paul would write. That's how what we would call it is a Pauline text. So typically, he would do like the doctrinal section, and then the next section would be like the uh, application. Like, how does this apply to my life? This is what you need to know and this is how you apply it to your life. So as typical Pauline text and writing, the first half is about doctrine, the second half is about application. The way that we're going to kind of uh, adjust it slightly to that is to help us understand uh, a broader picture, maybe a different type of a picture, that I received from one of my mentors that I, that I listen to and follow. His name's Skip Heitzig, and, uh, and he came out with a book called The Bible from 30,000 Feet. 
thought it was pretty cool, so we're going to kind of go through a study here. But this is what he would say in the book of Ephesians. He would say chapters 1 to 3 is going to focus on the wealth of the believer. So we're actually understanding what is the value of a believer. What is the value that comes with being a believer? Uh, chapters 4 to 6, verse 9, we're going to talk about the walk of the believer. And then uh, the warfare of believer comes at the end part. So what you're going to do is you're going to learn how to grow. You're going to learn how to walk as a believer. And you're going to learn how to fight as a believer. I bet you never thought you'd come to church and hear about how you're going to learn to fight. Right? we got to keep the peace. No, we're going to learn how to fight as a believer. That's going to be one of the, the very last week on August 30th. We're going to have a, a full service of worship and intertwined with understanding the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the armor of God. We're going to actually learn where that comes from in the book of Ephesians. And so we're going to learn how to grow, learn how to walk, and learn how to fight. Now, Ephesians is a fascinating city. It's not this uh, little town that everybody thinks is precious. Oh, we love Ephesians, right? Like, or Ephesus, when we call it Ephesians, uh, Ephesus. It wasn't this small town. It was actually a very, very booming capital of the Roman Empire. It was a trade route, uh, you know, from the east to the west and the west to the east. So people would come through there, and there would be trading that would go on, which which means that these people that understood money really well understood financial terms. And if you get into Ephesians and understanding the wording that was used, Paul actually uses financial wording. Now, we won't be able to pick that up necessarily ourselves because, well, this wasn't written directly to us. It was written from the Apostle Paul, probably from somebody who was scribing his words, and then it was sent out to the church in Ephesus. Now, this letter was written somewhere around AD 60 to AD 61, and uh, the interesting thing is that Paul had already been in Ephesus three times from his three missionary journeys, one of which he spent a couple years there growing and, and evangelizing and, and encouraging people, and, and he left some pastors to be there to kind of encourage them and kind of keep things going along. And now he's actually in prison. He's in prison. Isn't that a surprise? The Apostle Paul. Today, if we talked about how people kept writing letters from prison, you know what we would think. He's a troublemaker. He is a troublemaker. Well, when you come to the society in which he lived, you know, professing Christ, yeah, he was a troublemaker. He was causing all kinds of trouble for them because they wanted to live within their laws and their own understanding. And he's saying, no, 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 Jesus is the way to do it. And so once again, he's in jail. And he's in jail for about two to three years, maybe something like that. And in jail during this time, he writes four letters. They're typically referred to as the prison letters because he wrote a letter in prison. So these are the four prison letters. And the prison letters are, you have Ephesians, you have Colossians, you have Philippi, or Philemon, and uh, the, the other one escapes my mind, right? <laughs> you're like, Pastor, you're supposed to be on top of these things. And so he wrote, uh, he wrote so there it is, um, uh, Philippians, uh, Colossians, Philemon, and Ephesians. So the four letters, the prison letters, and this is one of them. Some scholars would say this is the Grand Canyon of his letter of the depth and understanding of this idea of redemption. Like it's so marvelous and so packed full. You probably have read it before. I know I have read it before and I'm looking at it going, man, I don't understand. What's the big deal? There's so much here, but that's the importance of us actually being able to go through this so we can pick this apart. So let's jump in here. We are going to learn today the wealth of the believer, a portion of that, of the wealth of of the believer. So Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read a few verses here. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to God's uh, holy people in Ephesus. And so we know that Paul wrote this because, well, it says so. <laughs> now, it's possible that, again, somebody scribed this for him, but it's actually God inspired Paul to, to send this letter out. To God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful of Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. People don't talk like that anymore, and they certainly don't start letters like that anymore. I thought it'd be kind of funny to start doing that from time to time, so I would do that. I'll start emails when I'll say, hey, grace and peace to you in the name of, this, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And those people that don't know me just kind of like, okay, just kind of receive it. Those people that do know me are kind of like, what? <laughs> They're like, what are you talking about? Well, because because it's, it's kind of a blessing, right? It's a prayer over somebody before you even get to it. This is a powerful greeting. This is an encouraging greeting. Um, and moving on. Praise be to God 
and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, for He chose us in Him. Now let's go back to the, the phrase where it says, in Christ. Say that with me. In Christ. Now you're going to see you're going to see this and hear this somewhere around 15 to 17 times throughout the book of Ephesians. And the reason why is because Paul is really emphasizing to the Ephesians that they are in Christ. Why is that so important? Because when you be when you begin to understand that your role is in Christ, everything that that Christ himself has as an inheritance from his father is translated to us too. It's not just directed to us, it's in who? Christ. So you're going to hear that a lot. It could be in Christ, through Christ, with Christ, regardless of the translation that you actually read, you're going to get a better understanding that everything wraps around that understanding. Now, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now, this is an interesting concept because some people have a hard time with this whole phraseology of that he chose us. In fact, we, we get a choice, and we say, well, God doesn't get a choice, right? Because we say things like, well, I don't understand how, you know, God chose me beforehand. That doesn't make any sense. Um, what if I'm not chosen? Well, choose to follow Jesus, and then you'll see that you were chosen. And so then somebody, well, that's not fair. Okay, well, maybe you're not chosen. I don't know. I'm just kidding. And so the idea here is, is that there's a level of understanding where, where God chose and knew you before the creation of the world. We don't want to miss the fact that God is, 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 is not guided by time. He is not controlled by time. So perhaps maybe even because he just knows everything that's going to happen, by perhaps maybe even then is that idea of being chosen. I don't personally, I'll be honest with you, even as a pastor, I don't fully grasp that whole understanding, but I'm not God. I'm just going to choose to trust him, and I'm going to choose to follow him, believing that I have an inheritance in God. Christ. So the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now again, that would be in Christ. Moving on. In, the lo in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. What? What does that even mean? It's this whole idea that even though we were not with him, he chose to bring us to him. You with me? Now let's talk about this idea of adoption. So my family went through the through the, the, the um, adoption, right? We went through the whole uh, sphere of it, uh, the understanding, the classes. We met Brooklyn when she was five weeks old, and she's a precious, precious little thing. And we decided ahead of time that, hey, you know what? We need to make sure that before we go meet Brooklyn that we actually want to do this adoption thing because if we go meet her, we're not really going to have much of a choice. We're just going to probably do it because we will just fall in love with her. So we decided in our wisdom not to make the decision, and then we went to the hospital. We met Brooklyn at five weeks old, learned how to give massages to this baby, and, um, and then we received her into our family. In fact, when we got there, they were so excited to see us that they were just like, I mean, there had to be at one point in time, six or seven, okay, pre-COVID, right? We're in the COVID mindset, six or seven doctors in the room with us because they were working with her and things of that nature. Long story. And so we decided that we were going to choose this child to be a part. Now, that's the, when we say adoption, we think that's, the, that's the, the, the picture of God saying, oh, you're so precious, I'm going to choose you. That's actually not the picture that we get here with this idea of adoption. We were not cute, adorable little babies. Side note here, through all of our studies and all of the data that I've seen, um, what age group do you think most people want to adopt? right? Babies. And primarily because they view the teenager as kind of like this rebellious, troublesome individual who has just had so much more life happen to them that it would be easier, <laughs> easier if we start as a child, right? Because the child won't grow up and rebel at then. And so then, so then we, we say, okay, I'm going to take this little child. And then we look at the teenagers because statistically teenagers, and, I, and I'm sorry to say this, they just don't get adopted. They age out of the system, and then they're kind of on their own unless they find some resources. The view of us in the adoption here is we were actually enemies 
of God. We were not these individuals that Jesus just picked up, you know, out of the water, God picked out of the water like Moses, you know, and the princess, and, and oh, this precious little thing, we were just kind of helpless. But no, 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 we were actually opposing God. We were enemies of God. We were rebelling against God. We were the teenager. We were the one that was in that situation, and God looked, and in His infinite grace and His mercy, He said, I want that one, right? There's a level of excitement that should come to a believer when you know that God chose you before the foundations of the earth. Now, you're going to say, again, well, how do I know that God, if God chose me? Listen, you get to choose. You get to choose whether or not you want to follow God. So you can choose to follow Jesus, and then you will find out that, look, guess what? You were chosen by God for adoption. So it goes on, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom. Now that phraseology, purchase our freedom, okay, that's a big deal with the blood of his son uh, and forgave our sins. What does that really mean? Well, in that day, obviously, there was a, there, this is like slave language is what this is. And what people would do that were actually trying to redeem slaves is that they would go to the selling block where they would have slaves, they would purchase a slave, they would pay whatever they need to pay, and then they would set them free. The whole purpose of them purchasing that slave was to give them their freedom. So the whole idea here is, is that in his rich kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom freedom. And what did he use to purchase that freedom? Well, he purchased it with the blood of his son. Parents, let that sink in for a minute. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. That's how much he loves you. He didn't just take out his billfold and say, throw down, he gave something more valuable than money. He gave his life. Because he knew you couldn't do it on your own. He knew you were a slave to sin. And the only way to get you out of that slavery was to purchase you with the blood of Jesus so that he could set you free. Now, I know people think that, well, if I follow God, if I follow Jesus, then I'm not going to be able to do some fun things that I want to do. And I've spent many times talking with teenagers in my, in my time as a youth leader where we talk about, you know, they want to be together intimately and they want to, they want to experience that. And, and it's a natural response. Like, it's a very natural response to, to want to engage in some sort of act as that, right? I'm being cautious with kids. And so, you adults get it. And so, there, these, kids, these people, they want to come together, and I say, okay, let's have a conversation about this. Let's say that you do this act, and you get pregnant. Did you have now more freedom or less? You see, God knows your life and knows what's going to set it in the best possible course. And so he's not trying to restrict you. He's trying to empower you. He's purchasing you to set you free. So you don't have to deal with, uh, with the emotional baggage, with the potential physical diseases that would come with just doing whatever you want to do. There's real freedom because he loves us. Going on to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 here. In Him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of Him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. That's a lot of words to say. He does it to accomplish His plan. He does not do it because he's trying to make you happier. He doesn't do it because, well, you have a life plan, and he's trying to make your life plan come together. I've known people that have had an amazing life plan, but because they gave their heart to Jesus, they chose to actually go a different direction because God called them to a different direction. I know of one man in particular many years ago who I believe had a full ride to a college and he was on his way there and in the last moments, excuse me, in the last moments as he gave his life to Jesus and Jesus says, hey, I would like for you to do this instead, he turned away from that focus and went to a Bible college because he believed that God was calling him to be a pastor. 
And what an amazing, whoa. And I know what you're going to say. Yeah, but that's crazy. Why would you give up all this and why would you give up all that? When you understand what it really means to be a part of this family and that your heavenly father says, hey, I know something you don't know. Here's where I want you to go. And by faith, you do it. That's when you know you're really all in. When God asks you to do something, it doesn't make any sense. Because he'll do that. He'll do that to you. And he'll make you think, oh, no, well, it doesn't make any sense. Well, of course it doesn't, because we don't always understand his thoughts. We don't always understand his ways. But we do know that he's good. We do know that he loves us. And he has placed us in Christ. Um, In order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory, okay? So that he's done all this, that we might choose him. There's no guarantee, right? There's no guarantee in any way, humanistically speaking. There's no guarantee that any of us are going to follow him. But he did this because it was the only way for it to happen. Continuing on. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, a level of branding, if you will, but not to the degree that maybe you think that somebody's going to hit you like with a cattle prod, right? But there's this level of marking that he sealed, the promised Holy Spirit. So when you choose to follow Jesus in your life, and in that moment, you receive that level of marking, which which is the Holy Spirit, which is to guide you and encourage you and to, to, be, to be a helper. I'm going to send a helper. And this Holy Spirit, this is when you begin to read the Bible and you begin to look through it and you go, huh, I wonder what this means. I wonder what this is understanding. That's when you stop and you just ask for help in spirit, right? Hey, God, I'm having a hard time understanding this, and I wonder if you would help me understand. And the Holy Spirit helps us understand this. If you have been reading your Bible for a long, long time, but you've always gone to church, you may not have actually made that transition. You may have gone to church since you were a child. The problem is is that you may have actually made your parents' faith your faith. Well, my parents were always followers of Jesus, or we would say Christians. My parents always were Christians and went to church, so I just always went to church. There comes a point in time in your life where you've got to decide. Are you going to follow Jesus or are you going to follow your parents' Jesus? It's so impersonal. When you pull out and you look, i got all these mutual friends of Jesus, but am I going to request it? Am I going to friend him? Am I going to make the decision myself? Continuing on. Oh, I'm sorry. Stay there, Dan. Uh, The promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing, right, our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praise of his glory. I understand sometimes you're looking at this going, what in this world? This is why we go through these studies to kind of understand a little bit better. Let's talk about the word inheritance. This would definitely be a financial term that everybody understands, especially if you've received one. An inheritance. So what does it really mean to have an inheritance of God? Well, there's a couple different things you can look at. First of all, you actually get God himself, which is kind of a big deal. You get God himself in your life, and that's part of the inheritance. Plus, we also know that Jesus was, and later on we'll read this, but I'll say it now, that Jesus was placed in authority over all authority, and that is, and he is the the son of God, and so we are in Christ, which then we receive that same inheritance. So just follow with me just for a moment. So we get God. You have God in your life. That's the inheritance. Another part of the inheritance is a renewed body when you make heaven. You ever get to a place in your life, uh, some of you have been there for a little bit longer than others, but you get to that point uh, where you start realizing that the work that you did the day before is now showing up in pain on your body today? Right? You ever power wash a driveway? You stand like this? It took me a little bit to come back up, (laughs) you know? So at 40, it's a little bit different. And I know at 50 and 60, it gets harder and harder. And our bodies are doing what? They're decaying. They're deteriorating because that's the way the world is. That's the way the world works is because it decays. And so when we reach heaven, our bodies are renewed. There's a level of the inheritance. And you know everything belongs to God. 
And if God is our Father, then there's a level of inheritance. We're told that we will inherit the earth. i got to be honest with you. I don't fully understand all that. But it sounds pretty awesome to me that I actually can receive my Heavenly Father in my life through His Spirit in who? Christ, right? Stay with me. In Christ, there's a level that we will inherit the earth, that we will be part of heaven, that we will have God, that our bodies will be renewed. Sometimes it's hard for people to grasp that when they're 13 and 15 and 19 years old because they don't feel any pain, right? But the reality is as you get older and as you get wiser, you begin to understand the significance of that inheritance. Okay, continuing on, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. It is so important for you to know God's Word. Why is this so important? Because we truly believe that God inspired individuals to write this. This is the living, breathing Word of God. This is the actual breath of God Himself. Now, I've had conversations with people that whether they mean to or not, they actually downplay the Word of God. They actually downplay the reading of God's Word. They actually say, well, so-and-so said that, and so-and-so read, wrote that. So, I mean, it could have been just his idea of interpretation. Someone had even mentioned to me at one point in time that you just need to, you just need to, listen, to, um, you just need to listen to the words of Jesus, and because we know that Jesus said those words. And I said, I guess I, I guess I could hear that. I said, but you understand that Jesus never wrote anything in the Bible, right? But people actually wrote what Jesus wrote. So if you're going to pick and choose certain things, you've got to understand you're on, a, you're on a dangerous path right there. Well, I'm going to believe this, but I'm not going to believe that. When it all comes together anyway, all 66 books, this whole encompassing, this all revolves around the same individual. It's, they're either focusing toward Christ or looking back at Christ and anticipating Him to come yet again. So this whole thing is wrapped around the understanding of redemption, God, and His people. Ephesians chapter 4, this is great, isn't it? This is a little bit different than some messages, right? Because we're kind of looking at like storylines and we're trying to understand these things. But this is actually like really the meat and the understanding of what God is saying in his word. It's so exciting. So he goes on and he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches. Say riches. Riches, right? The riches. And I'm not trying to do this prosperity gospel thing about if you give, you're going, to get, you're going to get a whole lot of money. I'm talking about riches in the sense that there are times when you give and that God gives financially to you. But there's also a level of riches in which he gives you health. One thing that I can tell you that God has blessed us with in our family um, to his glory is health. He has, re- he has given us such amazing health that we just haven't had to go to the doctor a whole lot. I have a doctor I haven't seen in a long time. I know I'm supposed to have those checkups, and I do from time to time, and I do running. When I go in, he goes, why are you here? I'm just trying to do the checkup thing. He goes, you're fine. And so God has really blessed us with the level of health. Others may be more financially, others in relationships. We don't know, but the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. You've heard that statement? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you? That's where this comes from. Now, this is the same that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in his right hand, or at his right hand, which would be a place of honor and respect and just a great place to be, the right hand of God, in the heavenly realms. So, if the Son of God has been given this seat, Jesus, and we are in Christ, guess who's, guess who's there too? Those who believe. Going on. Far above all rule and authority, so he's been given, Dan, go back one, please. I messed up. 
Isn't that great when a pastor says he screwed up? Here we go. Okay, seated, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Again, keep going forward. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, talking about Jesus here, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, you understand, we all have unique roles. We all, just like your favorite superhero group, right? Crosby, who's your favorite superhero group? Right? Do you like the Incredible Hulk? You're kind of a Hulk, dude. You're kind of like a Hulk. So you got the Marvel team, right? And, but, and they all have the same responsibilities, which is to take care of things and take care of people. But they all have unique, they all have unique capabilities, and so in the body of Christ, we are in Christ, that makes us the body, but we are not the head of the body. Christ, that's his unique place. He is the head of the church. We are not the head, we are the hands and feet of Christ. We are the body of Christ. He is the head, that's his unique place, and we have our unique roles. Some people are good with their hands and they can give with their hands. Some people give with their feet. There's different ways where they go and they do things and they travel. Other people use maybe maybe thoughts in their minds and creativity. There's we all have unique ways of doing this in the body of Christ. But this is what it's like when you become a follower of Jesus. You actually become part of a family. A God, right, this the God-inspired body of believers where we come together and pray for each other, encourage each other, welcome each other. Let me tell you, if you see somebody, believer, that is following Jesus for the first time, right after service, you know what? You go up to them and you say, hey, I just want to cheer you on. Right? Because we want to welcome people and encourage people. We're not worried about offending because we just want to celebrate you. We want to encourage you. You don't have to worry about offending people if you just speak life into them. Speaking life. And in this family of God, we, we get that camaraderie, that community life. That's what being a part of the family of God is all about. We become one body as Jesus is the head. Your uniqueness is celebrated the church isn't a building or an event. We've said this many times. You are the church. <laughs> now, why is it so hard when we don't meet? Well, because we miss each other. Those family members you like anyway, <laughs> you miss them after a while. And you long for them. There was a period of time where <clears throat> excuse me, um, we decided to just have some distance from some of our family. So we didn't do hugs. Steve, will you grab my water, please, buddy? So we didn't do hugs with our family. And that was hard. Did you do that? That was really hard. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Appreciate that. We, did, we had distance from each other. And then we, then we decided there was a period of time where we just simply just, this is, this is us, this may not be you, okay? This, you don't have to do this. We just had to. And so there was, we went camping with my mother-in-law, <clears throat> and Brooklyn was just dying for a hug from her. One, we said no, and she likes to do the opposite of that. And two, she was longing for that connection. And she grabbed her, and she held her. And she held, the longer Brooklyn held on, the more my mother-in-law cried. Because it was just that moment, like first hugs or something, we hashtagged it or something silly. And then we said, call my mom, come over. And the kids ran up to her. Because there comes a point in time where you just need each other. And I understand we don't need to hug right now. I understand. I don't want to push anybody towards it. I'm not trying to say any of that. I'm just saying you feel it, right? And when you're not around your church family, you should feel it. You should feel this longing for one another because you are a family. We are a family of God. Our Heavenly Father was always with us when we were quarantined in our house and stayed home order. Like we, He was always with us. 
And so that's good. In addition to that, he, he calls us to be a support to one another. Don't forsake the gathering of the saints, we're told. And we were still able to gather online. Thank you, online people that created online stuff. Appreciate that. Still got to see stuff, right? We were created for connection. And so don't be ashamed of needing this. It's okay. I needed it. I was so over online stuff. I still watch stuff, yeah. And for those of you that are watching, thank you for still hanging in there. I know you're getting tired of it too. But this is only temporary. Just like this earth is temporary. But we have a promise of the future. One day Jesus will come back. And I desperately want everybody to go. Don't wait. You are invited to join God's family. You are. You are invited to join God's family. And so I want to give you that opportunity right now. Maybe you have followed in the footsteps of your parents for years, but you never made it your faith. I don't want to manipulate you or do any social engineering to make you feel that you're going to do something someone else is doing. I want the Spirit of God to work with your spirit so you know it's true, so you know it's real. And so I wonder if you just bow your head for a moment and close your eyes. The family of God awaits you. And I wondered if you would be willing to just raise your hand and just tell me with your hand raised that you want to follow Jesus today. Would you do that? I want to follow Jesus today. Right? There you go. Yeah, I want to follow Jesus today. Maybe somebody here, you can put your hands down. Maybe somebody here is saying, and maybe this is you, I don't know where you, where you are. You might be saying, you know what, I've never actually followed Jesus. I've always followed my family who's followed Jesus. You can put your hands down. Maybe you're saying, you know what, I just, I did, but now I don't. Maybe, I don't know where you're at. But I know God is working in your heart. Because I, I've got to believe it. I've got to believe that he's working in your heart like he's working in my heart. And so I see everybody's hands. He sees it. He saw it before you did it. So as a family, together we do this as a family. So with your head bowed and your eyes closed, we're just going to say a simple prayer to invite those into the family of God who have never done that before or who are going to recommit. The same prayer can apply for both. It doesn't matter. It's a lifestyle. And so the reality is, I just want you to repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I choose to follow Jesus. Now, let me see your eyes. Would you raise your, raise your head here, open your eyes here? Here's the reality of it. You declaring that is just the start. It's the start of something amazing. If you're watching online and you're choosing to follow Jesus for the first time, click that little tab thing and tell us or put in the comments, I choose to follow Jesus today because there are people that need to follow Jesus because I'm telling you, the inheritance is far greater than anything we've ever experienced so far. In fact, we are told that the inheritance, the, that's our time in heaven, the glory that awaits us far outweighs the pain and difficult we experience now. And we're experiencing some pain and difficult, wouldn't you think? Yeah, we're experiencing some stuff, stuff. But the glory far outweighs the pain we experience now. You're invited. Everybody's invited. Now, believers, let me talk to you for a minute. You are called to act like God's family. Whenever, whenever my kids leave, or Trevor, Trevor's the one that leaves by himself more often because he's getting older, he'll go over and see his, his, fam, his mamma and papa and stuff, or he'll go with somebody and go do something, and I'll say, hey, Trevor, hey, don't forget, you're part, you're, you're part of this family. Don't embarrass me and don't embarrass Jesus. <laughs> and we'll say, we'll say that he'll just, uh, he'll, ro he'll roll his eyes. They're so good at rolling their eyes. Brooklyn has it down to a science. She doesn't just roll her eyes, she rolls her head, like she'll do the thing, <laughs> just to really emphasize it, right? So anyway, so, so you are called to act like God's family. Remember that illustration I talked about how your credit card didn't go through because you didn't realize how much you didn't have? What's worse is when you realize, when you don't realize what you do have. You're a child of God. Believers, you are a child of God. 
the one that created all things, that has all things, that controls all things. You are his adopted child. He purchased you with the blood of Jesus to set you free. Act like it. Be the church Monday through Saturday. Don't save it up for Sunday because it's fake anyway. Do it all week long so it's just so natural and normal for you just to act like a follower of Jesus. That's how you do it. Big idea for today, as we said, is we can all be a part of God's family. We can all be a part of God's family. You can be a part of God's family. I can be a part of God's family. We can all be a part of God's family. It was initially just set up for just the Jews, right? They received it, and then, and then it, it, as we're learning through the book of Ephesians, we're going to learn more and more that everybody's invited to be a part of this. Gentiles too, that's us, and we can be a part of the family of God. So while we sing this song, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about these next steps. You are invited to be a part of God's family. If you're still not sure, if you're still kind of on the fence, you can still follow Jesus today. You don't have to wait, but I want everybody to reflect on this. As believers, what's your role in God's family? What is your role? Everybody has a unique role, as we've talked about. You need to know your role. You need to know your position in Christ. And, and, and that way you can, you can be empowered to invite other people to be a part of it. Now, that's the second part or the third part of the next steps is you can invite others to be a part of God's family. God's going to bring someone to your mind right now that you need to talk to about Jesus. And you need to focus on that thought. Remember, he chose us when we were enemies. Don't think for a second he's just going to bring friends to your mind. You are a child. You guys can stand, you can stay seated, you can sing, you can just listen. But this song just celebrates everything that he just talked about. So we're going to sing together. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. And I see it now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again. condition had a plan from the start your son for redemption the price for my heart and I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand My heart has been 
sights long before my first breath running into your arms is running to life from death and I feel this rush deep in my chest your mercy is calling out and just as I stand please as we get ready for next week as we continue the study of Ephesians make sure that you take time this week regardless of what translation you choose to read version whatever just read read Ephesians chapter 2 it's a it's a great read you'll 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 be able to receive pray before you read and come in here ready to learn more and you can always reach out to me on Facebook for questions and we can just keep this dialogue going but don't give up just because it's hard supposed to be hard or else everybody would do it right thank you for being a part of community life now receive the blessing of the lord as you go out here today may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you and may the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace now go and be the church